All right, if you have your Bible, please turn to Genesis 50. Genesis 50, and so we'll be in another story this morning that is, I'm sure, familiar to everyone, but again, want to think about it in perhaps a little different way than you have before. So you're familiar with the story of Rachel and Leah's children. We don't often think about it that way, but if you remember yesterday morning and how we do not recommend marrying a bunch of people. Uh, one of the results of that was these 12 sons. And you can remember that kind of sibling rivalry, right, between Rachel and Leah. Imagine these sons and the insecurities that they must have. And then to have a father who adds to those insecurities by saying, you're my favorite, I love you much more than everyone else. Now, I'm sure your parents don't have favorites, or if they do, it's definitely you, which is tricky because I know there are siblings in here. (laughs) Right? And parents say they aren't uh, allowed to say they have favorites, but we also know, don't we? And Jacob, it seems like, didn't try to cover it at all. And so you have the story, what we know is the story of Joseph and his brothers from Genesis 37 on to Genesis 50 with a brief uh, sordid interlude in Genesis 38 with Judah and Tamar. But they already would have had tons of insecurities, right? Before dad picks one as his favorite. And of course that one as his favorite is the child of whom? Who's, who's Joseph's mom? Rachel. Rachel. Right? Makes sense. He's been waiting forever. She's been waiting forever. Finally, there's the son that I've wanted from the wife that I actually love. So he's the favorite. And he's a good kid who tells on his siblings. Right? You love that when your siblings do that. And none of you, I'm sure, have ever done that. Right? Brought a bad report. That's what happens in Genesis 37. Now his brothers are doing what's wrong. And he reports on that to his dad. He's 17. How many, how many do we have here? 17 here today? Okay. Several of you. He's 17 years old. He's your age. And for many of you, the age you'll be relatively soon, the next few years. And his brothers are older than he is, right? He brings this bad report. He gets a special coat, right? No one else gets that coat. He's definitely dad's favorite son. He's the one who's favored. He's the one who's going to get the gifts. And everyone else doesn't even get a gift at all. It's not like, you know, and parents usually are pretty good about this, right? We're going to spend $50 on each kid for Christmas. And you're like, $50, that'd be great. Or you're like, $50, are you kidding me? I get real money for Christmas. Like, okay, congratulations to you. All right? But your parents, if there's multiples, we have four children, right? So we try very hard to have it be even in what's spent. But it's tricky when you have some who are older than others, right? You can spend $300 and it's this big, you know? And the the other kid, you can spend $40 and they can play with it for years. Uh, So it gets a little bit tricky to try to keep it even. But you try to let them all know they are loved and they are cared for and they are valued. And I hope your parents are trying to do the same thing for you, no matter how they may feel about you uh, in the moment, as you guys live together as a family, and you know you have feelings toward them too. Okay, it's just, we're just the Bible's very real. Okay, it's not just these nice things for us to think about. So there's the sibling rivalries, along with the natural insecurities that would come from having four different moms producing these twelve sons for the one father. And so the older brothers, they are not fans of Joseph. And you know how that goes, right? One day he comes out to check on them, sent by his father to do so. He goes to check on them where they're shearing sheep up at Shechem. 
and they decide this is their moment. We're going to kill him. We're going to get rid of him. And Reuben intercedes. He's such a great guy. Let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery instead. What (laughs) compassion, right? Uh, So this is again, like there was a whole lot of do not recommend yesterday. This is another do not recommend. No matter how badly you want to sell your brother into slavery, do not do it. Okay, So that's application number one. Write that down. (laughs) Do not. Do not sell your brother into slavery. But what are we talking about this week? God comes through right on time. God works out His plans in exactly the time that He intends, in exactly the way that He intends, and He can do that even through and in and over and above the sinful actions of people. Now, God hates at the same time, and this is what's tricky and we shouldn't be talking about this this early in the morning, at the same time, God hates sin. Right? He clearly hates sin. So He hates seeing a brother sold into slavery and we're told in our text for today, which is Genesis 50-20, that the thing that they intended for evil, God intended the same act for good. And this is hard for us to wrap our minds around at any time of the day, but especially before 8.30 in the morning. But he tells his brothers, as they're coming to him, so he's already forgiven them. This is back in Genesis 45, that he's telling them, God sent me here ahead of you, I forgive you, everything's fine. But then in Genesis 50, dad dies. And the brothers are like, you know what, I bet he's been waiting all these years and he's going to take care of us now. He's going to mess us up now. And they come to him and go, we're your servants, we're your slaves, what can we do for you, what gifts can we give to you? And he's like, guys, don't you get it? I've forgiven you. God did this. It's amazing. I probably wouldn't be so forgiving if my brother had sold me into slavery. Although I'm the older brother, so it's more likely that I would have sold him into slavery. But he probably wouldn't have forgiven me either. But God used the mean things, the wrong things that they did to accomplish His purpose. And not just in Joseph's life. And it's not just his brothers, right? So Genesis 37 is the brothers selling Joseph into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And he's carried off to Egypt and sold again. But then what happens in chapter 39, right? Joseph is doing a great job. He's being blessed by the Lord. And Potiphar's household is being blessed by the Lord as Joseph is serving there. And everything is prospering. Everything's going great. And then everything goes wrong. He is falsely accused and thrown into prison. Now, he's been nothing but faithful, right? And I tend to think if I do the right things and I follow the Lord, things are going to go the way that I want. I'm going to get the position that I want. I'll get the job that I want. I'll have the family that I want. If I just follow God's will, everything will go the way it should. The Bible is a really big no to that. And so some of us, even growing up in Christian homes where it's like, we don't do the prosperity gospel here. Sometimes we fall for a different kind of prosperity gospel. That's not about, oh, if I just have enough faith or I pray hard enough or I get a a handkerchief that's been blessed by the right person. You know, we don't do any of that stuff. But if I have my devotions today, God will surely bless me. Right? Our team won because we were right with God. Okay. The other team's all Christians too. What's, you know, that's not why you win at Frisbee this afternoon. It's not because God is blessing you and doesn't like the other team. Right? That's not how it works. Just because you're better than they are. Just, you know, you like that better anyway, right? But we can associate when things go the way we want with God's blessing. 
with a sign that this person must be right with God. Right? We even joke about the boy, he's living right. Don't live wrong on purpose just to test this, right? Because God does still hate sin. But you can be doing all the right things and everything can go wrong. Many of you have lived long enough to see this. And I'm not just talking about counselors or faculty. Many of you in these chairs have lived long enough to see that. We're like, I'm trying, I'm trying to follow the Lord and I don't seem to be getting anything for it. God sees and he knows and he is in charge and he is still at work, even in your deepest, darkest moments. And so for Joseph, now he finds himself, after being nothing but faithful, falsely accused and in prison. And so now Joseph gives up on God, right? Now I renounce him. I'm just going to wallow here in prison. Obviously, he's not blessing me. Obviously, he's forgotten me. Right? Or does the story go differently? Are you awake? No? Yeah. It's it's only Tuesday, guys. We got to do this, all right? Um, (laughs) Right? No, he doesn't give up on God. He's still being faithful. He's like the best prisoner ever. And soon, he's like running the prison for the guy who's supposed to run the prison, just like he used to run Potiphar's household for him. And the guy's giving him all the responsibility. He manages everything. And if a prison can be blessed, the prison is being blessed. You go, okay, well, you know, it's not exactly what I planned, but at least I'm moving up the ranks in prison. It's going okay. But he still longs to get out, right? To be free from this slavery that he was sold into by his brothers now almost 13 years ago. And one day there's an opportunity. There's these two guys who have dreams. You remember them, right? The butler, the baker, for the pharaoh, not the candlestick maker, right? For pharaoh, they have been imprisoned, and they each have a dream. And Joseph interprets those dreams for them. For one of them, he's like, sadly, uh, you're going to lose your head tomorrow. For the other one, good news for you, you are going to be restored. You're going to be lifted up, restored to your position. He's like, oh, that's great news. Thanks, Joe. You're a great guy. And Joe says, hey, I need you to do one thing for me tomorrow. After this super big thing I've done for you, like tell you your future, I need you to do one little thing for me, and that's remember me tomorrow and tell Pharaoh about me. And uh, what does the butler do? (laughs) He forgets. Like, really? Like, if somebody just told me, like, you're going to get your whole life back while your buddy here that you've been with is going to die. Like, I would feel like I could remember that 24 hours later. And Two years later, when he finally does remember, when Pharaoh has his dream, you know this story, you're like, Pharaoh has the dream, and he's like, I don't know what it is. And the butler's like, oh, I remember my sins this day. (laughs) There was this dude in prison. He could tell us our dreams. Joseph, let's go find him. Let's get him. Right? Two whole years later. And you go, wow, there's so much wrong done to Joseph. And that whole process took from 17, what some of you are, to 30, which I left behind a long time ago. 13 years. And if you're 17, 13 more years sounds like a long time, right? If seven years was a long time to work for Rachel yesterday, 13 years is a long time to be waiting for your freedom. Especially when you've done nothing but follow the Lord for that whole time. And for Joseph, it seemed it was getting worse and worse and worse. And he surely was tempted to think, God has forgotten me. God does not see. God does not care. But, as we know from the end of the story, if any one of those things had changed, 
Joseph would not have been in the exact spot that God wanted him to be to save the whole world. Right? Let's say the brothers aren't awful. And they're like, you know what? He's kind of annoying. The little brother who's better than everyone else in the family, those are really annoying, right? The older kids are supposed to be better. But a young one comes along, and he's the favorite. Oh, that's the worst. Let's say they just left it at that and didn't get along well. He's never in Egypt at all because there's no reason to go. Let's say Potiphar's wife isn't a terrible woman. And Potiphar's just really wealthy and everything's going great. And Joseph's not there. Let's say the butler remembers Joseph early. When he should have, right? 24 hours later. If Joseph had gotten free then, what would he most likely have done? He would have gone home. He would have said, Father, I'm still alive. And his family wouldn't have been coming down to Egypt for that. He would have been back home by the time Pharaoh has his dream. And even if the butler remembered him, they probably wouldn't have gone back to the land of Canaan, to Israel, to retrieve someone to help them. God used all of those sins that God hates to accomplish exactly His purpose. As Joseph will say in Genesis 50-20, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Right? Because you know what Pharaoh's dream was and what the result was. And Joseph ends up being the second in command of all Egypt. And then the brothers come back. They're bowing before him just like the dreams way back at the beginning that they were so mad at him about. And eventually he tests them to find out have they changed. Uh, And he figures that out through their relationship to Benjamin, who is Rachel's other son. Do they care for him? Will they respect him? Do they love him? Judah gives a great speech in chapter 44. And Joseph is moved, reveals himself to his family forgives them, and assures them, God sent me here ahead of you in order for this to happen. And again, that's hard for them to hear. They know what they've done. They know that it was wrong. He knows what they've done. God knows what they've done. He knows that it's wrong. That all of those things that happened to Joseph were wrong. And yet, God knows how to use even those things to accomplish His purpose. And remember, it was Judah. He was that fourth son. This time I will praise the Lord. And he's the one through whom the Messiah comes. Judah, who was part of selling his brother into slavery, becomes rescued by that same brother. And so Joseph doesn't just like keep his own family alive or keep all of Egypt alive. God uses Joseph to keep alive the line of the Messiah Himself. God came through right on time. Certainly not in the time or the way that Joseph would have preferred, but it actually turned out better for Joseph and for everyone the way that God planned it. And Judah would indeed have a far-off great-grandson who would be betrayed we saw yesterday from John 1.11, who came into his own, and his own did not receive him. He was betrayed, sold, not for 20 pieces of silver, but for 30, which was in Exodus, the price of a slave. Joseph sold into slavery. Jesus is sold for the price of a slave. There was real wrong and real consequences for those who participated in that wrong. But that moment was the moment that God had planned from eternity to use to save you and me. It's not just that God knows how to rule over Joseph. God was planning through Jesus and all that He would suffer for we who should be slaves and have been slaves to sin, for us to be set free through faith in Jesus. First Peter tells us that Jesus entrusted Himself 
to Him who judges justly. That's what He did. And through His faithful trust in the Lord, all the way to the death of the cross, He saves everyone who trusts in Him. And so there's a way in which Jesus is actually the greater Joseph who went through rejection by his earthly family, who went through betrayal by those who should have been his brothers, by Judas. And at his death, we're told his disciples fled. We know of Peter's denial, and it's Peter the one who's writing, but all along, Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He did that for you and for me. So that as we face insecurities, as we face difficulties, as we face sins against us, probably even this very day, we can entrust our souls to the one who cares for us, who gave his own life for us. I don't know how the story of your life is going to play out. You don't either. But God is working in every moment right we're familiar with Romans 8 28 that for those who love God all things work together for good doesn't mean all things work together toward getting into the right college doesn't mean all things work together toward getting that job that I had always dreamed of on the other side of my degree it means that all things work together for the good of being like Jesus We're conformed to the image of God's Son. And it happens through everything that we face as we, following Jesus, entrust ourselves to the One who judges justly, who hates sin and knows how to use it to accomplish His purposes to save. Let's pray. God, thank You. For the hope that we have that even in all the wrong that we do, all the wrong that is done to us, You're bigger than that. We thank You that You save us in spite of our sin. That at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For those like Reuben and Judah and the rest. For those like us. And would you help us today, as we walk through this day, to entrust our souls to you, who always does what is right, who does not wink at sin, even as you use it to put your people in exactly the right place to do the work that you have given them to do in this world while we wait for the next one. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.